panel would like to send many mail, more than happy. <laughs> So thank you very much, uh, Dimitrios. Um, it's very uh, special to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker for uh, all he has uh, done for uh, Flugent in, uh, in the past and still now. Uh, polymer physicist by initial training. He is a microfluidic specialist and currently a research director emeritus uh, at CNRS and uh, Curie Institute. He has co-founded uh, Institute uh, Pierre-Gilles de Gênes for microfluidics in uh, uh, 2011. And since uh, 1999, uh, he leads with the, within the Curie Institute, the MMBM team uh, dedicated to research on uh, lab on chips, um, bioanalytical method and transnational medicine. He has recently been awarded an ERC uh, on the theme of the development of uh, artificial organ. So please welcome Jean-Louis Viovi. je peux faire sur les pour cliquer sur l'écran. Bon. Hello, so uh, yeah, it's a great uh, pleasure, honor uh, to be uh, here. Of course, I am particularly uh, on one hand uh, proud because of uh, what Fujian have been become and uh, uh, being uh, uh, at least partly at the origin of it, but mostly I am. Uh, so grateful about all of those who made this possible, starting from uh, uh, the co-founder, Jacques and uh, Robert and uh, uh, Dominique, and uh, then uh, all, the all the people and uh, uh, Jeremy, who is also here, and uh, all the people who worked, as France said, it was a hard, sometimes a very hard way, so people who, who contributed to this and uh, all of uh, um, present uh, employees who now contribute to it and also founders who uh, accompanied us. But uh, today uh, I cannot, uh, I, I would not try to, to do as well as Jacques and France on describing the business aspect. And I have to I speak about with my, uh, um, I would say scientist cap and uh, uh, do some uh, uh, microfluidic application. So, okay, of course, the dream, as it was discussed a lot, the dream of microfluidics is by lab on ship to use a scale reduction permitted by macro technologies to uh, do automation and a strong scale uh, reduction. Um, uh, and there, there are the, the, the range of potential applications are really uh, uh, huge, and uh, we only have explored, uh, even though now microfluidics has about 20 years, we only have explored uh, a part of it, mostly in biology and diagnosis, but there are huge potential for development in environment analysis, security, uh, agro-food industry, consumer products, and so on. I'm sure this has a huge potential to, to develop. So the kind of instruments essentially you can classify in two families, the most well-known uh, are the high-tech system, which had already pre tremendous successes, <clears throat> especially, for instance, uh, next generation sequencing, uh, which is not all of us, uh, not all people know it, but uh, next generation sequencing, which has revolutioned uh, medicine and diagnosis, is a microfluidic technology, or digital PCR, with a good example of Stila, who is uh, uh, one of the strong uh, customers and has a fluidant inside. But, and there is another kind of whole family of, of uh, application, which will be to develop portable, what we call point of need systems in which really we use miniaturization, miniaturization not to make millions of experiments at the same place, but to transport 
the, the, the science and the technology wherever it's needed. And it's also very important, both in clinics, for instance, for a patient follow-up at need at home, but also for uh, environment applications. But all of these applications share the same problem. Uh, in uh, analytical, is the world to, to, to uh, the, the world to chip interface, because in most real-life applications, uh, samples are either chemically complex, for instance, if you imagine blood is a very uh, complex uh, fluid, or also can be uh, uh, polluted by many things, uh, for instance, in environment. And um, a second, um, a second uh, aspect is that uh, uh, anal analytes of interest are often uh, a very minor component in this complexity. An example, for instance, in uh, I will uh, come to later on, you'll see that it can be uh, a one per million uh, part. So what is, of course, the chip is very small. So um, if you want, for instance, in food analysis, typically the standard is to have less than uh, one uh, bacteria per gram. And if you have your microfluidic chip, which is, has a few microliters uh, in volume, uh, or even 100 microliters, you will not be able to, to do it directly. So a first solution, which is the most used one, is of chip sample for treatment. But for instance, for a point of need, uh, it will not work. And uh, a second aspect I have tried to identify here uh, is that uh, is to use a, a concentration. But then you have another problem because, for instance, if you want to analyze milk, look for bacteria in milk, you first try to concentrate milk to, uh, to push your bacteria, uh, enough bacteria in a small volume. But if you concentrate milk, you, get, you can lyophilize it and you get powdered milk, or you can uh, try to start to separate things and then you get uh, butter. And, uh, and of course, not all of that you cannot put in a microfluidic chip. And you can go even further after the butter, you can collect what remains and you get where this reference will be most for people from the East. You get something which is called La Conquayote, which I would strongly recommend to try on bread, but certainly not in a microfluidic chip. So the, the next, as in, and even more important thing is to be able to, during this concentration process, to be able to extract and purify only the species of interest you want to analyze. So this is, uh, in other words, how to come from micro to, mi to micro, but extracting only what you want. So in the macro world, we use, uh, there are se several techniques. One is a bead-based assay in which you mix your sample uh, with beads, which have, for instance, antibodies for what you want to capture. It's very well established, but again, since it's a batch process, uh, if you want to miniaturize it, you, you will uh, reduce the, the, the size of sample you can analyze. So, uh, and it, it's transposition, that's the problem of transposition to, to microfluidic. So to treat, volumes larger than the system, of course, the solution, you have to, to flow uh, the, the sample through the system, and then you can flow as much as, as you want. Well, with, of course, the price of time. And uh, in macro world, it's done massively by chromatography, both for analysis and for purification and, and so on. But the problem is that when you want to miniaturize chromatography, you have a big a problem, which is that the pressure drop increase dramatically when you miniaturize. So it's not a technique which is easy to, uh, to miniaturize. There is so uh, a very tempting alternative, which is also used in the macro world. Uh, in, uh, instead of chromatography, which has a high pressure drop, is to use a, a fluid ice bed. Uh, a fluid ice bed is a kind of a chromatography system which works upside down. You, you have a particle in a vial and you push it from below like in a quicksand. And so it's, it's floating, but 
there is a balance between the gravity and hydrodynamic force, which make a system which is steered, which has a high density, which is like a, a chromatography system, except that the fluid can much more easily pass. So it was very tempting for us to, to apply this to microfluidics, but we have again a problem is that, and I will see that uh, uh, a bit later on, is that there is a, a big, oh, sorry, I, I didn't want to do that. I looked for the laser. Is that when you miniaturize, uh, you have a, a problem in the scaling of forces. And so I, I'll, I'll go uh, down to, to show you that. We, um, we want to balance hydrodynamic forces and buoyancy force. But typically on colloidal objects, which are much smaller, and in chambers, which are much smaller. And now if we go to a bit, a very little bit of physics, uh, the, the drag force uh, uh, responds to, to this formula. And if you ju we just consider the scaling approach to see uh, how it evolves when you miniaturize. Uh, the, this drag force is, um, uh, when you scale down, uh, it decreases as the size of the uh, system and the size of the particle. So this drag force, if you take typically what is usual in, in bioanalysis, particles of a few micrometers going at uh, uh, one millimeter per second, for instance, you have a drag force which is of the order of uh, one piconewton. But if you now you want to drive, uh, 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 if you want to drive particles uh, against this hydrodynamic force by an external force, like the um, like what we do in a fluidized bed, uh, you see we have a problem because uh, uh, the forces. Uh, I, I'll go fast through that because that's where I never end uh, at, in time. But the problem is uh, gravity is a volume property, and the drag force reduce as a power one of the size, but the buoyancy force reduce as a power um, three of the size. So of course, when you miniaturize, it's a complete uh, killer. And so uh, in order to, um, to get rid of that, we had the idea uh, instead of using force uh, which derives from a field like gravity uh, to use a force which derives from a potential gradient. And what is the reason for that? The, the size of the particle will still uh, decrease when you miniaturize. And so uh, the, the one origin of the force will decrease. But the advantage is that when you miniaturize, you can make gradients which are much stronger um, uh, which are much stronger because they are inverse to, to, the, uh, uh, to the size of the object. And if, for instance, you, you go, I, uh, there are several forces deriving from potential, but here I focus only on magnetism. So he, again, you have this equation and you have a, 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 a mag oh, sorry, you have a magnetic force here, which uh, still scales like the uh, size of, of the object uh, at, at the power three, but there is a more complex uh, parameter uh, which scale it to the structure and allows up to, to go to forces which are in the same order of magnitude as the um, uh, as the um, as the uh, uh, flow forces. So now, so the idea now. Uh, is to try to have this idea replacing gravity uh, replacing gravity by magnetic forces. So the story started, uh, you see, quite more than 10 years ago with the PhD of uh, Anne Lenel, who uh, indeed was some, for some period accompanying uh, a fluid giant in its development. And at the beginning, we had the idea of making these uh, uh, magnetic gradients by uh, uh, using uh, magnets uh, around the channel. But in practice, hello, so how would, je ne sais pas comment démarrer euh, la vidéo. Elle est déjà sur l'écran, est-ce que tu la, tu la vois, tu la verras. Ah, ok, thank you. 
Okay, we had a problem when we tried. So we have these magnetic particles, which are immobilized uh, in the system, but we had a problem when we uh, uh, pushed it with a field that at some point, uh, as you shall see, there is a crack and essentially all the liquid uh, goes through this crack and uh, uh, it does not see anymore the particles. So we, it means that we have to be a bit uh, more clever in what we do. And uh, this, uh, sorry, this, uh, yes, the fact that the, the, the forces are not uniform and it's more, comp you have to balance uh, carefully the shape of the magnetic field with the flow field. So this is why we got to these uh, uh, more strange uh, uh, channel shapes. And the other aspect is that because all these things, as you shall see, are very uh, nonlinear, uh, it was really impossible to drive them with syringe pumps. So, uh, uh, so we started uh, to develop all these things. And again, as, as others said yesterday, we would not have been able to do that uh, without the, 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 the fluidant uh, systems. Um, and so now, um, you see what happens. I'm running short of time, so I'll start. You see that you have now a very pleasant fluidized bed system in which you have a recirculation. So it really works as an agitated uh, chromatography uh, uh, system. So it has a very, for, for application, uh, we have to deal with that, but it, from a physics point of view, it has a very interesting uh, behavior in which uh, hysteretic behavior, if you, um, if you flow liquids at you start increasing progressively the pressure, at first nothing happens. And at some point there is a, a, a burst of, of the system and it becomes, a, the, the bed opens as we say. And so this is of the reason because why we absolutely need the fluid gen system there. Because if you push it with a syringe pump, pressure builds up, builds up. And when the field opens, the pump continues to push and all the beads go out. So with the fluid gen system, it controls immediately the pressure and, and go back. And so, but for making a long story short, we have this hysteretic behavior. We can deal with it. And we started doing applications. So the first ap application we developed, and this was uh, with um, the group of uh, Miriam Taverna and uh, Zuzana Bilkova, was immunocapture uh, of a protein for a diagnosis of uh, various diagnosis. In that case, we were uh, considering mostly Alzheimer uh, diagnosis. And you can reach a very nice uh, pre-concentration factors and uh, very nice also uh, limits of detection. Uh, the, the idea shown up there is to capture on the beads uh, the, the, the protein you want to capture and then to, to elute it. Then we switch to, so this, these are the, the, the results I already mentioned rapidly. It. So uh, a second application uh, we developed uh, was to try to uh, capture circulating tumor DNA. Uh, it's called the, the liquid biopsy concept, and it's, uh, it's uh, presently growing very fast for uh, cancer diagnosis. And typically, circulating tumor DNA is about uh, 10 to the power four uh, less abundant uh, than uh, other uh, types of DNA. So you really have to have a very uh, strong uh, purification. So we developed a system um, in which we have first the specific capture of DNA uh, and, uh, uh, and then we send the DNA on microarrays in which it's detected. It was with um, uh, the group of, um, uh, oh, uh, sorry, I, 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 I missed the name just for it was, you see, uh, I miss the name uh, for the moment. Uh, okay, and then uh, I see I will uh, switch to uh, an application which I found particularly uh, exciting, which is uh, back because it's the uh, regarding detection. It's really 
probably the most challenging, and uh, it's the detection of bacteria. Uh, and currently, and this of course is very important in many, many aspects, in food analysis, environment, uh, but also uh, sepsis. Uh, and uh, current technologies are really very old style. Even now they do uh, uh, analysis in this flask and, uh, uh, and plates and so on. And typically, sorry, Typically, it takes uh, several days, and for uh, for many applications, it's a big problem, uh, especially for sepsis, for instance, because the analysis, if it takes several days, but one hour delay increases the mortality by this 17%. Uh, so uh, there are uh, molecular typing analyses, like uh, which are indeed microfluidics with PCR, but the problem is they 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 detect the DNA. So they don't detect the infectious bacteria. Even if your body has successfully resisted and uh, you only have a debris from the bacterium, uh, it will give you a positive uh, result, whereas indeed it's, the, it's not positive. So what you need to, to analyze is the uh, infectious bacteria. So we address this problem uh, within a European project to uh, detect uh, salmonella. As you know, it's a, it's a, it's a real problem uh, in food. And again, the, 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 the need for, in terms of analytics, analytic sensitivity is, uh, is very uh, stringent. So we started with the same ID. We have beads uh, in our system which have antibodies directed against the bacteria you want to capture. And you flow the solution with the bacteria in, and you detect them by various ways. You can use fluorescence and so on. But uh, we realized that the sensitivity was uh, still not uh, sufficient. So we had the idea that instead of, since people use um, culture for amplification, in the macro world, why not do the same by flowing culture medium in the, um, uh, in the uh, microfluidic chip directly uh, after a capture and even during the, the capture of the, of the bacteria. So I will probably, uh, uh, so I, yeah, I can, I think I can, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, excuse me. So uh, go a bit faster on that. So here we, it's a model experiment with fluorescent, uh, with fluorescent bacteria. And uh, you see that the fluorescent signal is here is growing and you have an exponential growth of the bacteria. So we were very happy when we uh, did see that. But the student working on that even uh, uh, did see something which uh, at the beginning was really unexpected, the serendipity-like uh, effect. So you look uh, on the top here, you see the time. Remember that these analyses in the real world takes uh, a few days. So we are flowing the culture medium, so nothing happens. And suddenly, after four hours, you see that the bed is exploding. So at the beginning, they wondered what was happening. But what was happening indeed is the fact that the, because the bacteria grow so much, they start to use a lot of the volume and they expand the, flu the fluidized bed just by their own volume. And so finally, in the end, it gives a system in which you can detect the presence of the bacteria directly by visual observation uh, and so we, it gives us a lot of hope for point of need because you don't need a microscope, you don't need a detector, you don't need anything, just naked eye. If you want to be more sophisticated, we realize that uh, this, uh, this growth of the number of bacteria was a reminiscent uh, uh, of, of course, exponential behavior, which is expected. And another thing is that depending on the quantity of bacteria you put in at the beginning, you see you have the same curve essentially, which translate to the origin when you increase the number. And this reminded us of, of PCR, of course. And so, and indeed this is exactly the same system because both, both cases are 
or uh, exponential amplification. And by that, we can do calibration curves, which are perfectly uh, uh, linear in log scale, and uh, detect the initial, quantitatively, the initial number of bacteria uh, at, uh, with uh, five orders of uh, magnitude dynamic range. So, uh, as a transient conclusion, and I think I'm almost uh, close to, to, to the end of my time, unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, we believe it's a very generic front end microfluidic uh, well to chip interface, which can work for protein, for DNA, for bacteria. And, um, and now, because of that potential, we wanted to see how, if we can, start to, to think of industrialization. And that was uh, developed as a kind of example within a European project developed uh, if, by Fugent, a holy fab. Uh, so the first, uh, there, are, so there were several people involved, uh, both in terms of collaboration and also at, uh, at uh, Curie. And uh, the first aspect was to, uh, to make mass production of chips. And so this was developed with, in collaboration with uh, MIPA in Spain. And you see that now they deliver, instead of doing chips by uh, uh, PDMS, which is nice for fast prototyping, but now they can, they send us chip by the hundreds, by the thousands. The second aspect was to uh, uh, go from the, uh, the system we had on a microscope and so on, to a miniaturized system, which can be carried in the lab or on the field. And uh, this is, this was also, uh, uh, this system was developed by, this nice system here was developed by uh, Fluigent. And so with that, uh, we uh, applied it to a, a new application, which is still for um, a DNA uh, detection, but in that case, um, uh, we wanted to capture all DNA, so with a non-specific uh, capture system, but I won't go in detail because it repeats a bit what we already did regarding DNA. And in that, uh, using a system in which we use a balance of uh, electric forces to capture and then release the DNA. And again, that we have, it's not, we are not at the end of the way, but uh, we are uh, already have encouraging uh, results, uh, able to go down to clinically significant concentration with 10 times less uh, initial uh, sample. So I finish with acknowledgements. Um, we had, of course, in this long story, uh, uh, different fundings, and also, most importantly, the people who, who worked uh, on it uh, by order of appearance uh, in the group and also through for collaboration. So our very beginning collaboration with, with uh, Susanna Bilkova at University of Pardubice and Miriam Taverna at Faculty of Ma Pharmacy, with Anne Lenel and uh, Laura Malakin, who was at the lab at this time, uh, then really the switch to this new geometry of fluidized bed uh, was uh, done uh, uh, by uh, Sabnae Tabnawi and uh, Yago Pereiro, and uh, with a strong insight, uh, we really, really the people who led us to, to this fluidized bed uh, realization were uh, Marc Fernigier and Olivia Durour at the SPCR. And then for the DNA, uh, we started a new collaboration with both Curie clinicians, Valérie Tali, who, spoke, who was there yesterday, and uh, uh, Mats Nilsson from the uh, University of Stockholm, and all the, um, uh, the, the, the cell uh, aspects uh, were developed by uh, still uh, Iago Pereiro, Ahmed Bandali, Lucille Alexandre, and with nice collaboration with Bruno Dupuis at Institut Pasteur and University of Crete. And finally, the last aspect to go into our industry, uh, we're in the lab uh, under the heading of uh, Catherine Villar with uh, uh, Josquin Court, Paul Donzier, and the people from uh, uh, Fluigent. All the I, I didn't put all the names there, but many people from Fluigent participated to, to this uh, project. So I thank you very much and I apologize for the. We have time for a few questions to uh, for Jean-Louis. 
Yes. Could you come back to the concentration of proteins? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Show concentration of antibodies in your, in your device. Can you tell us more about the application you want to use it for? But, 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 oh, yes. Uh, no, it's not this one. So in that case, in that case, the idea was to do a detection. So um, uh, so the yes, in that case, the idea was to uh, uh, was to uh, detect the IgG to uh, as a diagnosis of uh, infection by the, the quantity of antibody you can uh, get the. Uh, you can get the, the status uh, status of infection. Of course, again, it's it's generic. So we also try to uh, uh, um, to capture um, uh, peptides uh, for Alzheimer, but in the, for instance, in the cerebrospinal fluid. So any kind of protein we can. Uh, so indeed, there are two ways to to work. Either we concentrate it for analysis uh, ex situ, or you use a fluorescent system and you also can make the detection in situ by fluorescent imaging of the chip after capture. But then we have a problem. If we want to do fluorescence, we have a problem of sensitivity because the, the beads are relatively absorbing. So it's not ideal. For sensitivity, it's better to release and detect out of the... Um, out of the chips, which is what you see indeed uh, in this uh, uh, in this um, in these curves here. So this... how, long, how long can you go for this biological sample? Um, you mean the, the volume of biological? The, the minimum volume to, to actually make the, the capture effi sufficiently efficient that you can see. Well, this depends so much on the concentration. I cannot tell you uh, the answer because it really depends on the initial concentration. So the, the minimal volume we can work with is in the order of the microliters, tens of microliters. The maximum volume uh, will be in, in the order of milliliters. Uh, and of course, then you have a balance between the time, because if you want to pass, if you want to start with a small volume, uh, it will be fast. And if you want to have a larger volume, you can either increase the size of the chip or you can increase the time. And you cannot increase the size of the chip indefinitely because then the hydrodynamic changes. So, so it's a compromise to make. So yeah, I cannot really tell you, but uh, uh, the, the the pre-concentration factor is about 1,000, which is a really a nice result. We, maybe we have time for one more question. So maybe then... We have, yes, we yeah. have one, one question on li online. Um, based on your experience in scaling analysis, Please, could you share insights on how to disperse magnetic beads uniformly in viscous solution? Because oh, it might tend to settle down to the bottom of the channel due to gravity. Um, yes, because they are relatively dense. Um, so, in some sense, if the medium is viscous, it's less problematic because the sedimentation. Uh, speed will decrease with the viscosity of the system. So it's more a problem. If it's viscous, the, the sedimentation is less of a problem, but of course, uh, mixing uh, is a problem. Mixing in a, a microfluidic system is a problem that uh, Patrick uh, has been working a lot on and uh, has uh, also uh, described. So there are, there are tricks for doing mixing uh, in uh, microfluidics, and we can use 
any of these tricks. There is the, the thing invented by Armand Ajari and uh, Jacques Pro in, in which you use uh, microstructures on the side of the channel to create. The idea is to create vortexes to split and recombine and so on. So there are methods, but it really depends on, uh, on the system you want to work to. So this is for doing mixing. And then for preventing sedimentation, we often use uh, vibrations. So ultrasound or even 